Logic Pedagogic Conference here in Bergen. It is great to see you all here. And I'm very excited about the program in the next few days. Looking over all the interesting topics, I think it's going to be uh, some really great days here in Bergen. In this year's conference, there's also an urban touch, which I think is perhaps more relevant than ever. <coughs> The 24th century has been coined the urban century, the century where the majority of us live in urban areas, in an ever-increasing pace. Urbanization brings opportunities and economic growth, but they also bring serious sustainability issues for land and water management. Climate change doubles this challenge for sustainable urban water management. We have just had the warmest summer, or some of the war one of the warmest summers, I guess, on record in Scandinavia and much of the Northern Hemisphere, while Australia has had a very cold winter. Climate extremes and adaptation adds another challenge to building resilience into our urban water systems. We are approaching a uh, time where 60% of the population in the world lives in urban areas. And in the western part of the world, that's already some 80%. This brings severe pressure on our infrastructure and our resources in urban areas. Infrastructure that has been built piecewise over more than 100 years. Here in Bergen, there are more than there are 850 kilometers of sewer pipelines and 350 kilometers of surface water pipes. That is a total distance longer than driving from here to Copenhagen or Stockholm, just inside the city of Bergen. The urban water system could not be called an agile system. We cannot quickly change and adapt as we need. In this system, we also in Bergen, they have more than 24,000 sewer manholes and more than 8,000 surface water manholes. The list of pluvial induced urban floods is almost endless. If you start, if you do a Google search for pluvial floods, the list is very long, even within the last five to six years. They span all climates from cold subarctic to the tropics. It is, a, it is a common challenge for all urbanizing areas across the world. <laughs> it is also, to a large extent, independent of development uh, level. There is a general failure of our urban piped infrastructure, from Copenhagen to Tokyo to Mumbai. In September in 2015, Oslo got hit by a series of heavy rainfall events over the 1st and 2nd of September. Kranbeam, as you see from the pictures here, is a classic gentrified neighborhood where an old industrial park has become modern urban housing. The Alma River runs through this area partly as a covered culvert, culvert with a mix of natural river bottom and as a tunnel. <laughs> Upstream Alma is a natural river that is managed as a natural river in a narrow river corridor. During the flood, it looked like this as one of the manholes on the culvert burst and the water flooded the whole area. We were asked to estimate the most likely flow during this event as the gauging station at the location had been overtopped. The Alma River watershed stretches from the west on the top down to through Kranabeam and down to the Oslo Fjord. The watershed has two measuring stations, the Alma station, which is at the bottom, or the Alma station at the Kranabeam, with a relatively short flow record of five years at the time, and Westley at the top where the gauging station had been since 1984. In addition, there were 12 precipitation gauges around surrounding the watershed. The precipitation records from the day showed high spatial variability of the event. You also see that there's a natural annual spatial variability of rainfall in this water, relatively small urban watershed where of 300 millimeters from the top, from the bottom to the top. If you plot the precipitation event the day of the 2nd of September on the IDF curve at Westley, so the station at the top, the event, you can see there's a large range in return period compared to that station. It really just shows us the precipitation is a point measurement. And the IDF curves we very often use in our design is not necessarily you don't have to go many meters from your original station before you might be quite far off in the actual precipitation. 
this was uh, it was found to be an 18 year return period at the official at Blinna, this is the official station in Oslo. <coughs> Looking reconstructing with hydrologic modeling and statistical inductive database mechanistic models, we were able to recreate a po possible flow range. The black dots are the observed values, which we know we cannot trust as the flow as the V notch uh, was overtopped and the calibration range. So the top of the black dots we know are not the true. The red lines is the 95% confidence interval, and the median and the mean are the two blue lines, which are overlapping in this plot. You can see here that the most likely flow that day was just shy of 100 cubic meters per second. So if we use an extreme value plot for the Alma River with 95% confidence intervals, the predicted maximum flow the 2nd of September would have corresponded to a median value of over 800 year return period. However, in an urbanizing watershed, the flow series can no longer be assumed to be stationary, and we, can not, we cannot do this exercise. But we can see that the, compared to the annual maximum flow, it was a large event. So how did we get here? This is the case of a relatively modest rainfall event of 18 year return period, which is actually within the design standards of a combined sewer system, which should be designed for 20 year return period. It, it's a very good example to illustrate the magnitude of the problem of our urbanizing world is facing. In most cities, the development is somewhat radial, making the downstream system the oldest designed for a totally different flow than it typically receives today. <coughs> the cost of renewal also means that we have to live with part of the system we built many decades ago for many more decades. As mentioned in the beginning, Bergen has more than 8,000 surface water manholes. A decision to change all these to blue-green solutions is not an insignificant one. All these 8,000 manholes are also located in roads and other places where it's difficult to just go and change them. This picture shows the Alma catchment in 1957. And you can see that it largely is an agricultural watershed with some urbanization at the bottom. The red dot is the location of the Kranobin uh, location. Today, in 2015, the watershed looks like this. You can see that it's a fully urbanized watershed. It shows that urbanization that has been going on, they're just like in all growing cities. In the same period, on the world basis, we have doubled the world's urban population. So this is not unique to Oslo, and it's what's happening everywhere. <coughs> this means we really need to rethink and transform how we think about urban water management. The common denominator here is, in the urbanization process is the seals impervious surfaces. There's a direct link Lots of, lots of research has shown that there's a direct link between impervious surfaces in the watershed and stream water quality, and also stream flow. And this is what we have done to our world. The other side of the, this is the other side of urbanization, that we need to, and we need to find better and more sustainable solutions. And this requires both political policy changes and technolog technological solutions. As a typical, we, we see here that you five. 80% impervious areas, you can up to five times the flow. The European Commission has made an urban water atlas of Europe that came out in 2017. In order to ensure water-wise and resilient cities, which can address the risks resulting from climate change, whilst maintaining a high level of urban life, cities should strive to understand and optimize the interactions between their water services and other critical infrastructure. Measure and critically assess their current performance whilst defining specific, measurable, achievable, and realistic objectives with a precise timeline. They should engage in true citizen engagement, employing a participatory and open approach. They should promote green and blue economics at local and regional levels. And they should join forces with other cities in collaborations and communicate and share in a clear way information concerning water management. 
create a legacy of true connections between generations from the youngest to the oldest. In this Urban Water Atlas, it's really interesting reading. I recommend you all to go online and download it from the European Commission. They have made what they call the City Blue Grid uh, Index. The City Blue uh, Blueprint infographic summarizes at a glance how well a city currently manages its urban water resources. This information is important to help identify priorities for future actions and investments, but also to visualize strengths and weaknesses. The Blue City Index is intended as a baseline against which future assess assessments can be benchmarked. In Norway, we like to think of ourselves as frontrunners with respect to environmental policy and, and actions. And though we certainly are in some aspects, the Urban Water Atlas of Europe reveals that we are far from frontrunners with respect to urban water management. Examples from the Nordic capitals reveals that Oslo is second last, beaten by Stockholm, Copenhagen and Helsinki. This is a scale that goes from, I think the top of the scale is, I'm not sure, I think the top of the scale is 10. Um, and then we obviously like, uh, I've grouped them into different shades of blue. So we're comparable to London and Bologna. Um, but we see that many Nordic cities are, are, oops, are better than us. Um, and though we certainly do not like to lose to our Nordic neighbors, I guess it means that there's lots of room for improvement. And there are lots of things that are currently, under, under, uh, currently underway in Oslo including what is probably Norway's most aggressive blue-green implement strategy for implementing blue-green structures. So I am sure that the index will look different in a few years. It is, it is also a great opportunity for Norwegian cities to learn from their Nordic neighbors. As a general comment for all the Nordic cities, it says that they have a high drinking water consumption. This should be an aspiration for greater thinking into how we can do more reuse of water, not only uh, waste water, but also stone water. Probably in more stone water in Norway, or in Nordic countries. So how can we promote sustainable water use in a country and a region with very little direct water shortage? Though we have seen cases of water restrictions in many areas of Norway over the dry summer we have had, mostly this is due to capacity problems in the water distribution system which could lead to undesirable pressure drops if everybody starts watering the garden at the same time. In order to promote sustainable water use, we have to start building resilience through society and science. In this, in this light, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal is an important, as important for the developed world as for the developing world. These should guide our decisions and our long-term strategic path. Several counties in Norway where Sanofir and Asker were the first have adopted the Sustainable Development Goals to be the guiding principles in the county's strategic long-term planning. Sustain the goal number six talks directly about water and sanitation. However, in building urban resilience, sustainable water management is also linked to goal number 11, sustainable cities and communities, goal number 13, climate actions, Goal number 14, life below water. Goal number 15, life on land. And goal number three, good health and well-being. The water crisis and climate changes are tightly interlinked. Without blue, there is no green. A sustainable climate change policy is also good water policy, making it, possible, making it a possible framework. Water is, an, is not just an individual sector, but also a connector. Good water management is in many ways good urban development. Water can be the connector to build urban resilience through a reinvention of how we think about approach and approach our urban surface water management. Our urbanizing world is a dynamic place. It's a place where we often take actions and choices that greatly affect the environment and the natural cycles. Like we all know, 
water and the hydrologic cycle is greatly affected by urbanization. Already with as little as 10 to 20% urbanization, which equals a typical single family residential area, we have single family house, like normal house residential area, we have permanently altered the water balance. Up to the fully urbanized, <coughs> using traditionally urbanized, where we have up to five times the runoff volumes, five times the water that we now have to handle and manage. So our best strategy should be to generate less of this to handle and manage. In Norway, we have adopted a three-step approach to uh, urban water management. An approach that was first introduced by Peter Stada in the city of Malmö. In step number one, all small events should primarily be managed through infiltration and retention. <coughs> Precipitation that does not become run surface runoff, like evapotranspiration from green roofs. In step two, we seek to detain the medium-sized events. Detention to rain gardens or detention basins, as one example. Rain gardens connected to the sewer system will, for example, function as a temporary detain detaining stormwater before it flows through the system. The last step, step number three, about safe floodways. Where does the water go during the extreme events? In order to avoid, minimize, avoid or minimize flooding. Urban roads and streets are floodways have become of more and more in interest for several municipalities. As they offer above ground conveyance, they can alleviate combined sewer flooding. And already this afternoon, there is a very interesting presentation about this very specific topic. Actively using measures from multiple of these steps in an urban surface management, uh, we can build resilience. It should not be about which solution is best. It should not be about building rain gardens or green roofs or detention basins. It should be about a set of measures. A set of measures will divide the risk of failure and add resilience to the overall system. As a few examples of research on measures in Nordic climate, I will first talk a bit about green roofs. Green roofs in Norway fall under category one and two. They are filters for retention and detention of precipitation. In Norway, green roofs typically need little to no watering, especially in coastal areas. However, there are exceptions like this summer, and these exceptions will become more frequent. For several years, we have asked what is the optimal design thickness and composition of these roofs for stormwater management. There is a rather extensive evidence base in more temperate climates, but there is not automatically transferable to Nordic conditions. Though several research project, through several research projects, we have looked into the design of specifications for stormwater purposes. One of the things we have done is to calculate the potential retention of water in various locations around the North Sea. Retention in the green roofs is the amount of water that is evapotranspirated and hence function uh, and it's hence a function of which is a function of temperature, solar radiation, wind, and plant specific water consumption. This is all the water that never becomes surface runoff. How much water is theoretically possible to use? We can calculate that. Doing this for different locations, we can produce a thickness versus annual retention graph as you see here, for some locations. When the curve flattens, we no longer gain retention capacity by adding thickness. So it's a, it's a measure of how much we can evapotranspirate out of the system, given the plant species we have. Substrate thickness beyond this will just function as a permanent dead pool, or you can see it as a drowned reservoir for summers like this we have just had. But a drought reservoir will also uh, add more or less permanent weight to this roof, which will have structural implications and also economic implications in constructing the building. So there is a trade-off. From the graphs, we can see that there is most retention to, uh, to gain when the KC, which is the plant-specific coefficient describing the plant water use, is initially low. So there's a trade-off between plants 
with high KZs, we then use a high, lot of water, but also then the water it needs. So choosing plants that needs that can use more water, we also maybe end up with plants that need to be watered. We also see that there's an annual retention is more a function of the plant species than the thickness. This indicates that maybe the plant selection should be further investigated. Currently, we have focused a lot on substrate types, and maybe there should be a greater focus also on the types of plants. This graph focuses solely on retention. And the full, here is the source for the full paper of this, of this study. Um, this focus is solely on retention, however, we are as interested from an urban water management point of view as a detention, which is the short term, detaining the water. Uh, while retention can be measured over a long period, like weeks or months or years, detention is generally interesting on an event basis. And even more so, we are interested in what is the consistent expect expected performance. This data is, uh, then, we, we are interested in basically what is the performance we can expect out of these green roofs every time. If we then go to another aspect of hydrology, flow duration curves, which is, tip, is a plot that shows the percentage of time that flow in a stream is likely to equal or exceed some specific value of interest. For example, it can be used to show that the percentage of time river flow can be expected to exceed a design flow or some specific value. Applied to stormwater management structures, and in this case green roofs, we can investigate um, the performance over time. So we can look at what is the expected performance. On this plot, you see data from four pilot green roofs um, produced by one of our PhD students that will talk in the afternoon, uh, Birgitte Johansson. Uh, and she's produced these curves, uh, flow duration curves from four different locations. And there's four years of data going into this plot. And you can see the difference in performance. Uh, there's some different types of roofs and there's different locations. If you look at the Trondheim all the way to, the, to your left, you can, for example, most cities, they manage their, they can measure the time they water their combined sewers going combined sewer overflow, so the time they discharge combined sewers to, uh, to a river or a recipient, or they can measure the number of times it happens. So in, in, in there, how they uh, set their goals, they might say, we're gonna not have more than this many hours, or we're not gonna have more than this many events. You can use a flow duration curve then to see, okay, how many roofs need to be green before I can move up across, uh, across this graph from 50, for example, here, to four to eight hours, where the, where the black line is the original precipitation line. This gives you a much better design way of thinking in terms of what is the consistent expected performance. Of course, as I said, here is four years of data. We can't always collect data. We need. We can't always wait to measure. Developers, developers don't want to wait to measure for four years before they build something. They want to know. So we need to transfer this into modeling. Um, and there are we have there are, we have done some of that. And there's a flow duration curves. Uh, there's a presentation. This also in this session in the afternoon uh, about flow duration curves uh, for green roofs and bioretention modeling in Oslo. It's also of interest to know what is the, typically another thing is what the C factor of a green roof, because we typically design, uh, we use the rational format a lot in urban design. And that is another one, uh, detention based questions where we want to know what's the C factor we can calculate with green roofs, which is also a presentation this afternoon. Another side of green roofs, much debated lately, is okay, so they might be good for all these small events. How do they do when it really starts pouring? Um, so, what is their performance during extreme events? And the Center for Research Based Innovation, Climate 2050, we have a large observation roof with three different plots at Hövdingen, which is the wastewater treatment plant in Trondheim. And in Climate 2050, the focus is risk reduction through climate adaptation of buildings and infrastructure. So we wanted to test 
these pilot groups' performance during extreme events. Of course, you can't, if you wait for an extreme event, it typically never comes. So we, uh, so we decided that we, should, uh, we wanted to build uh, a rain gauge system where we could simulate. So we built a rainfall simulator to full scale for this roof. Now we'll see if technology works. So that equals not one liter per minute will be 60 millimeters per hour. So we aim to run the test until the time of concentration for the roof. So when inflow is more or less equal to outflow. You can see that it took 20 minutes for the inflow to equal the outflow. Given this, giving this roof a time of concentration of 20 minutes. And we had applied, at that point applied about 20 millimeters of rainfall. In reference to the IDF curves in Trondheim, this exceeds the 200 year event, which in Trondheim is estimated to 13.6 millimeters. In Oslo, a 200 year 20 minute event is 23 millimeters, so just above this. And in Bergen, it's exactly 20 millimeters for 20 minutes. It's a 200 year storm. So this was definitely in the extreme category. But what's interesting is that the roof has a long, also to know, there is a good retention in this, the detention in this roof, but we also see, it's worth to say that this roof has a long flow path. So there's 11 meters up from the top to the drain, which of course contributes to, uh, to the time of concentration, concentration in the system. But there is a significant detention for such a large event. And at the beginning, the roof was a field capacity. So we had pre-wetted the roof. This indicates that the green roofs can alleviate an extent of flooding, also for larger events. We will, of course, do lots more runs with the simulator, but this was an initial result. One of the conference's sub-themes is uh, surface, surface water ground, and groundwater, uh, surface water, groundwater, and blue-green solutions in urban areas. Handling surface water in cities is a challenge. Green roofs can be step one, then rain gardens and bioretention areas can be infiltration to groundwater can be part of step two. There are some international research on the performance of these rain gardens in temperate climate, but we still need a larger evidence base for a Nordic climate where winter infiltration is an important aspect. We also have an increasing number of melt days during the winter months that's important to have capacity, infiltration capacity throughout the year. This is a picture of the rain garden at Riesvall and in Trondheim, which I believe is one of Norway's oldest from 2010. This is a summer picture, uh, pictures that typically of what it looks like in the summer. While in the winter, it typically looks like this. Winter performance is key if we are to truly transform urban water management in countries like the Nordic and Baltic countries, where winter and frost is a, is a substantial part of the season. Though the extreme precipitation typically as is associated with summer months, performance in the winter is equally important. Especially also since we live in a region where precipitation is spread out even more or less evenly throughout the year. Building resilience into rain gardens means that we need to have infiltration capacity in the winter. And we need to avoid standing water and ice formation, as you see to some extent in this picture. Um, this specific rain garden we know has a lower infiltration rate than we recommend today. And this can be, as you can see from this ice formation in the, in the winter. As part of this conference, there will be a tour of the rain garden at Bryggen, which is built to infiltrate water and stabilize groundwater. You will learn more about the whole history behind this project, but it is a very nice example demonstrating the clear and strong link that is naturally exists between stormwater 
and groundwater. Also, a great example of international research exchange between Palace Bekam and very good colleagues in the, in the Netherlands through several projects and today through the JPI Water Indexes project. Already uh, in the first sessions about blue green solutions, you can learn more about infiltration of stormwater. We measure infiltration with these what we call MPDs, modified field dense infiltrometers. They are single ring infiltrometers. Um, which, we, which gives us good results with a low water consumption, which is why we typically use them as it is challenging. Uh, it, they, they only require uh, what can be carried amount of water. This is a winter picture of the rain garden in Bergen and Bregen, and this is what you will see when you see it tomorrow, how it looks in the summer. And it's always great to see how this is the rejuvenation of these perennials in rain gardens from looking quite sad in the winter to by the time spring rolls around they become nice and green again. Last year we also had a master student that measured weekly infiltration rates uh, from October through May in the rain garden in Trondheim, plotting the seasonal infiltration rate. It is clear that we need to decide for high infiltration rate in the summer in order to maintain sufficient capacity in the winter. The infiltration will typically be lower in the winter but it should be high enough to avoid standing water uh, on the rain garden, which will result in ice formation. In warmer climates, typically, this is a very good example why we can't just import knowledge from, uh, from more temperate climates. Internationally, in warmer climates, typical infiltration rates uh, recommendations are 1 to 3 centimeters per hour. While through uh, our research, uh, we, have, we recommend 10 centimeters per hour infiltration rates in order to keep good performance throughout the year. This recommendation gives capacity for extreme events and ensures performance in the winter. It's a very good example of why we need local evidence base. These are just some very few examples of how evidence-based research is so important to build resilience into our system. We need to use international research as the basis and then we need to add to our local evidence base to make the solutions accessible and suitable for our conditions. In order to put these examples into meet the demand, uh, in order to put these examples into uh, and meet the demands and needs of the future, we need also to change the way we think about the water cycle, especially in urban areas. The real water scarcity we now face for drinking water in large areas of the world forces us to think water and wastewater together in a circular way, where stormwater can can and should be an integral part. Though desalination is often the first thing that comes to mind when we think, think about new drinking water sources, it is far more energy uh, intensive to desalinate seawater than to recycle wastewater through advanced treatment. Even in areas with less pressure on the water resources, climate change will bring, uh, bring more extremes like this summer. Situations where thinking in a circular way will add resilience to our so even in countries with no water shortage, we should aim for best practice. As of today, there is no cost for stormwater discharge in Norway. Though this might change in the future, this, limit, this limits the incentives for to collect and reuse rainwater. However, for large-scale green roofs or other green infrastructure, <coughs> rainwater collection can be directly connected to operating costs, as you're saving on drinking water for watering needs. Rainwater collection should go hand in hand with green infrastructure, and it's a good example where we need both policy and technology change. Reuse of stormwater is a great example of how water can be connect connected between sectors. It brings the dimension of stormwater and wastewater into the smart city thinking through transformation and reinvention of urban water management. Urban farming and beer from stormwater are two great examples. This beer, which I tried in Amsterdam last summer, uh, and was a very nice one, so I recommend it next time you're in Amsterdam, uh, are additions that complement the mainstream. They are not necessarily uh, what should become mainstream, but they are nice additions. And most importantly, it creates citizen involvement. It is not the people sitting in this room. It's not you guys that we need. We are already informed. We are already nerdy interested in rain, flood, and blue-green infrastructure. 
like this picture from last Friday in Le Mans in France, at the Le Mans race circuit, what is the first thing I spot? I spot the green roof on the building in the pit area. I'm not sure my husband was very impressed with me. <laughs> um, so this connects to what the European Commission said. We need to connect with the citizens and we need true citizen engagement. The reuse of water involves treating used water to a quality acceptable for an intended reuse while posing the least amount, least risk to the user. Examples of reuse include irrigation agreement infrastructure, urban farming, public parks, sports fields, household landscapes, toilet flushing, and laundry, to name a few. All these reuse options require specific water quality dictating the level of treatment necessary. In many cases, the reuse requires a quality much less than that of drinking water while remaining completely safe. This is known as fit for purpose and represents a critical step in the transition to a one water society, a fully integrated one water culture where every drop of water is available, every, every drop of uh, available water is renewable, including complete recovery of treated wastewater. The one water culture might be not the ultimate goal for the Nordic countries, but we, and reuse can be challenging to implement an, ex, an existing and buildings and infrastructure. But it is important to think about both, uh, both retrofitting and new construction. We can and we should add stormwater reuse also in the Nordic countries. It reduces the need for treatment of drinking water. It reduces the pressure on an already overloaded collection system. It follows the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, which should be the basis for our decisions, and it is best practice, which is what we should strive for. With that, I'd like to say thank you, and I hope you will enjoy this conference with loads of great presentations and burger. The weather forecast even promises some real burger weather on the Wednesday to give you the full experience. <laughs> thank you.